Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with veteran jazz pianist and composer Sharon Minimoto. We talked to her about her new 2023 CD, Dark Night, Bright Stars. Since the age of 16, this Vancouver-based artist has been performing to audiences around the world. She's got quite a road and a lot of stories. Enjoy this interview. Thank you for taking a minute out for Neon Jazz. I appreciate it. Oh, man. it's my pleasure. Thanks for asking me. I really, really enjoy Dark Night, Bright Stars. But before we get into that album, you know, we, we survived this pandemic, so to speak, over the last three and a half years or so. And I'm curious, as a jazz musician, how did you get through it and how has it changed you? For me, to be honest, like the beginning of the pandemic, I, I mean, of course, it was um, quite scary for everybody, but I actually really enjoyed having a break from doing a lot of teaching and then running to a gig right after <laughs> it's like a long teaching day. So I kind of savored that time to go, oh, I'm just going to play some music at home and write a little bit of music. So um, the beginning wasn't as bad for me. I guess like the first maybe even year I sort of enjoyed my time at home. <laughs> Although, I, of course, I miss playing gigs, but um, it just allowed me some time to do some put some thought to some music stuff that I hadn't had time for before that. But then it got really tiresome, and then, you know, we did some live stream stuff up here in Vancouver, and that was okay, uh, but really hard to, uh, you know, play your heart out and then go, okay, and there's no no response to it. You don't know if anybody's watching. You don't know if anybody likes it or not. So that part I found a little bit hard, yeah. So talk to me about this new album. How did it come together? Was it kind of an outgrowth of the pandemic? Talk to me kind of in general how you artistically constructed it. Um, well, I'd written a bunch of tunes, and um, I think probably half of the tunes I wrote before the pandemic, and, you know, I was thinking maybe 2020 or or early 2021 in my head before the pandemic started. I thought, oh, that would be a good time to go into the studio and of course that was not the good time to go into the studio so um i just kept writing during the pandemic and then um when we were finally released uh, uh i talked to the other guys in the band and just said well maybe we should do this when we have a chance and then um we're really lucky to have a guy in town who you probably know Corey Reed, who's a really yeah. great sax saxophonist and um you know he books frankie's jazz club which is the best jazz club in Vancouver, and then also um, he's got his record label called Seller Live, and he said, I've got some grant money. Um, do you want to put an album out here? And I was thinking, well, of course I do, and, uh, you know, of course it's a lot of money to for jazz musicians to put out their own records, so that was a huge help, and, um, and it was really great. Um, Corey has this thing called Jazz at the Bolt. The Bolt is a art center in uh, Burnaby, B.C., called the Shadbolt Center, and he has this thing called the uh, Shadbolt Jazz Walk, I guess. So um, people go around from room to room, and there's three different rooms to listen to music in. So a whole bunch of us who were part of that series, uh, we all recorded um, a few days later. So, um, you know, bands took either one or two days to uh, go into the studio and then record an album. So that's kind of how it all came about. So talk to me about what are you hoping the listener gets from this album? Well, I hope that they read the liner notes. I know most people don't. <laughs> but uh, there's a connection, you know, with each song for me, uh, you know, either to do with the loss of some friends or maybe creating um, a visual image. Uh, one of the tunes on there is called Letters from the Midwest, because I went to school in Creston, Iowa. Uh, I'm not sure if you know where that is. But uh, anyway, so I have stayed in touch with those friends for, I don't know, I guess 30 years now, more than 30 years, and uh, I, I found a box of letters from them uh, when I was uh, moving, and just uh, trying to, I named it uh, the two letters from the Midwest just to, sort of reflect the joy of finding these old letters and having those memories. So hopefully it, it uh, triggers some of that happiness as well when people listen to the record. 
So you've mentioned Iowa. Take me kind of back to the beginnings of your life and how, you know, music and jazz more specifically became a passion for you. Um, so I started playing the piano when I was five. Um, my older sister started when she was four. So my parents thought I was like way behind the ball here <laughs> because mm. well, you're five now. You should have started last year. Like what's going on? So um, I did classical piano for, uh, I guess, 10 years. Um, and I guess when I was in grade six, I started saxophone. So I did concert band and then in high school um, in grade eight, I started jazz band and um and I did choir and jazz choir. So I did all the music stuff. I had I was very fortunate to go to a junior high school in, in Canada. Well, actually not all in Canada, but where I grew up in um, Richmond, B.C., which is a suburb of Vancouver. I had junior high was grade 8 to 10, and senior high was grade 11 and 12. And um, I was very fortunate to have good music teachers who are really into pushing the performance aspect um, for the students. So we had a lot of performance opportunities. Like we had in grade 8 through 10, we had like noon hour shows every month. So it was kind of like a gig that you had every single month. So um, anyway, so that was sort of my earlier uh, training. And then um, when I was in grade 12, I got a scholarship to study at this little college in Creston, Iowa, called Southwestern Community College. Um, and by that point, I was doing some choral arranging. And um, there's a really great uh, choral arranger named Phil Matson, who was teaching at Southwestern Community College. He's a brilliant jazz pianist as well. So um, I got to study there for a year. And then... Um, and I came back to Vancouver because that that school was focused more towards um, vocal jazz and, and chamber choir. And I realized that I really wanted to play more piano. So I came back to Vancouver and then went to Vancouver Community College for one year and then Capilano, what's now called Capilano University, for um, the rest of my degree. And, uh, yeah, and then in the meantime, I sort of studied on and off uh, with various people, Don Thompson, who's a great Canadian pianist, vibraphonist, and uh, bassist in Toronto. And I've studied a bit with um, Jeffrey Keither and Kenny Werner and Rini Rosmus as well. So what was the first live jazz show that you ever saw that blew you away? The first live jazz show I saw was Oscar Peterson Trio. Um, so I wow. was... 17 and he came to Vancouver and I I'm embarrassed to say I don't remember who was playing drums like it wasn't Ed or anybody. Um, um, like it wasn't uh, one of the guys who's on a lot of the records is what I'm trying to say uh, but Dave Young was the bass player and I'm still and I tried to think about that a few weeks ago like well, who was that drummer on that gig um, and I can't find it anywhere online um, but I'm going to have to ask a few people because I was only 17 and I was sort of just new to listening to jazz and I knew I liked Oscar. Um, yeah, and we lived, my parents, family lived out of the suburbs, so my parents let me take the car downtown and go to hear this concert. And it was really amazing um, just to hear that kind of energy and, you know, to hear a legend for your very first jazz concert is uh, pretty mind-blowing. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so that was pretty uh, inspirational right off the top. It was like, oh, yeah, people who are live can play like this. This is serious business here. <laughs> yeah. So speaking of stages, what was one of the stages that you all ultimately always wanted to play on and had the chance to do it? What was the dream venue for you? I would love to play at the Village Vanguard, and I have not. Um, <laughs> but I have played at Birdland in New York. Um, one of my good friends, who's actually from British Columbia as well, Melissa Vanderscape, she's a, um, in theater, but she's a really good jazz singer. We we met each other when we were in high school in an honor group together and stayed friends all this time. So she wanted to do this gig, and um, so she got me to... Um, come over to New York, and we did a show there at Birdland, and then also one in Florida, but that was like, quite a thrill to, to be there, and 
you know, just knowing how many people have played there and, you know, how many records I have and stuff in there. So, um, that was, I guess that's probably the, the biggest, uh, stage I've played on, I, I suppose. So ultimately at the end of the day, what do you love the best about being a professional musician? What is it that you look forward to the most? Um, well, I love all the interactions, you know, the musical interactions, uh, with the different musicians, you know, like every time you go to work, it's a different group of people. So I really enjoy that variety. And then, of course, the personal part about that, you know, getting to know everybody, you know, over several decades now um, on the breaks and sort of seeing how their life stories influence how they play music. I, I find that really fascinating as well. And... um you know, the better you know people personally, I feel like you can have a better connection with them musically as well. So, why do you love jazz? Oh, well, it's super fun. <laughs> um, I love the, you know, um, just that you never know exactly what's going to happen on the gig. You know, you might have a set list, but... You never know what everybody else is going to do. You don't necessarily know what you're going to do all the time. You, um, you know, you might have a tempo in your head, but your solo will be influenced by what else is happening around you musically. So I, I love sort of the spontaneity part of playing jazz and and the, uh, the harmonic surprises that we can take if someone's sort of uh, going to throw in some subs. Uh, sorry harmonic substitutions um, at two on the gig, then that's fun too. Um, so, yeah, I just, I can't imagine, you know, going to a job where I'd have to do the same thing every single day. I just really enjoy, you know, okay, well, today it's a solo piano gig. Tomorrow we're playing with big band, and next day it might be a quartet or a quintet playing original music, Um you know, in the next day, um, it could be just playing standards with a trio. So uh, I enjoy all of that. So let's say you have a dream tonight. You run into a much younger version, maybe when you were starting to play music professionally, and you could give that young version of you a piece of advice based on the wisdom you've gained so far in your life. What advice would you give your younger self? Oh, that's a good question. Hmm. I would probably say be more willing to take a few more chances. I don't mean musically, but just when you're young, maybe you don't have to, I'm sure young people have a different, completely different concerns now, but um, I would take more risks. Like I'm not going to care about, you know, saving money so much. I'm going to just try and, you know, put this band together and go on the road. Like I never did uh, the road thing where you, we were sleeping on the floor of people's, apartments that we knew in other cities I never did that um, because I never wanted to put um, anybody else in the band in that situation where it wasn't an ideal situation but younger people are pretty resilient and I think they can deal with that so I probably would have taken a few more chances I probably would have um, you know spent more time away um, from Vancouver even though I love it here um, just to get some different perspectives I probably would have um, gone to explore a little bit more uh, some, a few other scenes and then still come back here as my home base but um, j just to have uh, some different perspectives really So Sharon, everyone out there has a perception of you, family, friends fans, but ultimately you're in control you run the show. What's your perception of you? Who do you think you are? Who do I think I am? <laughs> oh wow <laughs> uh, Well I wear a lot of hats um you know, because, like, I teach and I, I've i been teaching at Vancouver Community College for over 20 years now, and I compose music, and I also uh, book a, a room that has jazz here in Vancouver. So I don't know. I think I think of myself just as a community, like a jazz community member, um, you know, just trying to make music that makes other people happy and trying to express myself through music 
I don't really think of myself as one thing necessarily, I guess. So, Sharon, you got any live shows, anything lined up for the end of the year, beginning of next year? Um, yeah. So, I guess on December 30th, I'm playing at a place in Vancouver. This is the winery that I booked. I'm playing with uh, my friend Adam Thomas, who's a really amazing musician. He sings kind of like Ray Charles, but he plays guitar. He also plays bass, um, but he's playing guitar on that gig and singing. So, I'm doing that on the 30th, and... Um, in the new year, I've got a gig at Frankie's um, doing a Tony Bennett and Bill Evans tribute with a singer named Carmen J. Price. And then my quint- quartet sorry, will be playing um, at the Shad Bolt, uh, Jazz at the Bolt event this year. And I'll also be playing with um, a legendary guitarist in Vancouver named Oliver Gannon, who's one of my very good friends and mentors. He's 80 now, and he's still killing on the guitar, and uh, I'm really looking forward to those gigs. So if anyone out there wants to pick up Dark Knight, Dark Knight Bright Stars, anything else that you have, and in, in just in general, finding out about shows, where's the best place for them to go? Uh, probably go to my website. There's most of my gigs up there. There's also a great site in Vancouver called rhythmchanges.ca and you just click on the calendar and the fellow who runs that site he puts all the gigs on there so there's you know like about 100 gigs uh, a month listed there I think usually um, and it's very comprehensive he's got all the times a couple charges it, like, he's doing a real great service for all the jazz venues and musicians in Vancouver um, yeah and I have a couple of other albums out I've got um with with my quartet, I, the previous one was called Safe Travels, and then the one previous to that was a trio recording called You Can See the Ocean from Here, and the first rec- record that I recorded is called Side A, which is a uh, quintet album. So, uh, yeah, there's a few uh, albums to choose from. I don't know that Side A is actually on streaming it. it probably is because it's part of the Seller Live catalog, but um, Trio One, I don't think it's on streaming, so um, but I still have some, so someone can contact me through uh, my website and I can mail those all if anybody wants to buy them. Thank you so much for talking about the new album, your life and music. Best of luck with everything. I really appreciate your time. Thanks so much for having me and uh, your show's great. I checked out a couple of interviews last night and you're doing a real service for all all musicians everywhere i'm so amazed that uh, you found me because i'm all the way over yeah. on the west coast of canada it's great thank you thanks for listening and tuning into another neon jazz interview where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players and minds in vancouver new york city kansas city and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz thanks to sharon for her time energy and story you want to hear more neon jazz interviews you can find us on spotify and apple podcasts subscribe to us at youtube and for everything neon jazz go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com until next time enjoy the jazz my friends Neon Jazz.